warm welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here and uh, as our last seminar for this 2021 um, interesting year. Uh, the plan for today, uh, similar to other uh, talks that we've done here at CQ, we'll do some introductions for the first few minutes um including myself sorry polly gardner so i'm a cq fellow and i help to coordinate the seminar series so hi uh we'll do some introductions then uh, ruth will take it away with a presentation for approximately 45 minutes and i understand she'll invite some one or two other people to join her in that presentation and then we'll follow it up with a question and answer and some discussion so hopefully you can stick around um, the whole thing should take about about an hour and a half. Um, just a reminder, Tenzin is um, recording us today so that this presentation is being uh, recorded. And we'll just ask that during the presentation, you uh, ensure that your microphones are muted. And during the presentation, we'll ask that you turn your videos off. And then when we open it up for question and answers and discussion, then we'd love to see you all, um, particularly if you're posing a question. Now it's my great pleasure to invite uh, CQ fellow, um, Dr. Naomi Tulin to introduce our speaker for today. Thanks, Polly. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Ruth Rodney. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Ruth at the very first day of the PhD program in September 2012 at the Faculty of Nursing at the U of T. Um, Ruth and I connected right away. And one of the things that we had in common was that we both had great clinical training, but very little slash no training in the social sciences. And so for the first couple of semesters, when we take these classes on critical qualitative health research, for us, it was almost like being in a foreign country, right? Like it was like new language for us and we'd be Googling stuff and we'd laugh and Ruth just really helped me survive the PhD program. But I think our, our um, wonderful supervisor, Dr. D Denise, Gestaldo had her work cut out for, for her um, with the two of us for the first couple of semesters anyway. Um, Ruth is an assistant professor at York University um, where she studies violence prevention and she's also a CQ fellow. And one of the things that we've been doing at CQ is looking at axiology. So like looking at the values and ethics that should underpin critical qualitative health research. And some of those uh, values that I think of are things like an ethic of kindness and radical generosity, humility and authenticity. And gen genuinely, um, I think that Ruth embodies all of those values and ethics. Um, in addition to her academic roles, she is a proud Hamiltonian and she serves on the boards of the Canadian Caribbean Association and the Canadian Mental Health Association in Hamilton. So welcome Ruth, we're all looking forward to hearing you speak and I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you so much, Naomi, for uh, that warm welcome. Um, it means a lot to be able to uh, be introduced by a dear friend and colleague. Um, and as Naomi said, uh, you know, we studied um, under the supervision of Dr. Denise Gistaldo, who I'm sure is also on this call. Hi, Denise. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to um, first thank you all um, for sharing this space with me. Um, right now, I am calling in from the traditional territories of the Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Neutral, Erie, and Mississaugas, also known as Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, this land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. And I've really been reflecting a lot on um, that covenant and what it means. I'm not sure if everyone on this call is aware of what is currently going on in Hamilton, but on November 24th, um, several youth who are predominantly black uh, went to support an encampment um, that had just experienced a fire. Um, and they went to that encampment with food, they went with resources, um, and the city went with an eviction notice. Um, subsequently, two people were arrested that day, one being a Black woman with a disability. Two days later, another Black woman with a disability was also arrested. 
Um, in calling for her release, several people went to the police station and three other black youth were arrested. And so as a community, we are calling for um, those all charges to be dropped. Um, and so if you would like to stand with me um, and my community in calling for the charges to be dropped and calling for an end to evictions um, of encampments, as well as a, ju a judicial inquiry into the events of that day, um, I would ask that you read and sign the petition. And one of the things that I, I've really been thinking about, again, is um, reflecting on that, is that regardless of how so we- that oh. Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, and so regardless of how we might forget our own humanity and continue to somehow believe that um, a public space is no longer acceptable for the public, the land always continues to provide. The land provides a space as encampment um, residents continue um, to get evicted from public spaces. Um, and also when I think about the land acknowledgement and recognizing that um, it supports so many uh, of us um, always to only take what we need, I'm also reminded of the fact um, of that the land is also the keeper of our ancestors. And earlier this year, my sister transitioned. Um, and I think that I am so thankful to this land that her body is cocooned in, in and I know that she is safe in her final resting place. Uh, and before I began this morning, unfortunately, my friend lost her grandmother in Trinidad. And this is a, a wonderful woman who cared for us in her, in her home. She fed us. Um, and just last month, I um, spoke to her and was showing her pictures of my son, who she um, had called her grandson. And so I say all this um, to tell everybody on this call that I hope that um, you and your families are all safe and healthy and well. Um, and I hope that if there are any of you who are ex have experienced a loss or have family that are um, experiencing challenges, health or otherwise, I really do send you all strength. I send you love and I hope that you are wrapped in the support um, of your social networks and um, communities. And so what I really wanted to do today is to tell a series of stories that explain our, our research to this point. Um, and, and where we are right now is we've completed data collection and are now in the process of transcribing our recordings. Um, and what I'm gonna cover here is the story of how our research was developed, um, the creation of our research team, um, and uh, the beginning stages of recruiting our participants. And when I was beginning to prepare for today, I had a very unsettled feeling when I was looking at the abstract and seeing only my name um, on the, the abstract, even though I wrote it. Um, and, and really, I guess what I thought about is this is the first time that I am presenting on work that we are currently doing. And while I am the lead researcher, I am part of a collective, I'm part of a team of people who are completing this work. And so it was very important to me to share this space with them. Um, and some are going to be on the call today. Unfortunately, not everybody um, was able to make it, um, but it's important that you all see the faces and hear the names of everyone um, who is in this research. And so I would like to um, introduce them all to you. Um, Jessica Bonilla Dampty is the executive director of the Sexual Assault Center in Hamilton and area. She is a Latina Indigenous woman from El Salvador living and raised in Hamilton. She is a doer and is actively involved in community based projects and believes that it is important to include children in those projects. She is committed towards and works to creating a world without violence and oppression. Danielle Busno is an Anishinaabekwi from the shorelines of the Great Lakes. Danielle is currently an Indigenous Strategy Training Specialist at Mohawk College, and she used to be the Diverse Communities Outreach Program Coordinator at SASHA. She is a multidisciplinary artist, a seed keeper, and an avid gardener. She is responsible to the land and the water, her ancestors and descendants. Marsha Hines is a dual career professional in the areas of advocacy and educational and research. She lived and worked in Barbados before returning to Canada. She lectured at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill in St. Augustine in Trinidad and was also a researcher for the trade agency in Barbados. 
She is the immediate past president of the National Organization of Women um, there as well. Alia Khan is a PhD student at York University researching gendered Islamophobia in space. She has substantive experience conducting research and outreach initiatives for various nonprofits in the greater Toronto area and holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning. Alia considers herself an anti-racist feminist and is deeply invested in approaching systemic inequality by and through community engagement and coalition building. Anika Ford has a Master of Science and is a social entrepreneur. She has nearly a decade of experience in the nonprofit international development in corporate spaces. Anika has successfully led transformative program targeted at decolonization, inclusivity, anti -oppression, and anti-oppression. Anika is passionate and knowledgeable on diversity, anti-racism, anti-oppression, and equity. We also have a community advisory board who we have called the elders. Dr. Janice Jackson is, re is a retired educational psychologist who spent her career working on issues of domestic violence. She was the national representative for the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action and a founding member of the Guyana Volunteer Consultancy. She wrote and presented on domestic violence and child abuse in a number of sectors and has been a consultant for a number of governments. Nawaka Gishi Miguan, also known as Lyndon George, is a two-spirited male Ojibwe member of the Kettle and Stony Point First Nations. He is the Indigenous Justice Coordinator at the Hamilton Legal Clinic and a community activist. Sandra Lemus used to be the Diverse Communities Outreach Program Coordinator at SASHA and has been a supporter of women's rights in Hamilton for many years. And so I wanted to ensure that everybody um, on this call is aware of all of the people that are contributing to the work that we are currently doing. I also want to say that um, Janice is here, uh, Danielle will be here as well as Marsha, and I'm thankful and I'm drawing strength from them. I'm also drawing strength from my mother and both my aunts who are also on this call. And so what I wanted to do is first to tell you about how our research began. And so on June 22nd, 2020, the Hamilton Students for Justice organized a demonstration outside of Hamilton City Hall to have police removed from schools. Students shut down a main street in Hamilton while a crucial debate and vote was occurring with city councillors as to whether police would remain in schools. Jessica and I were in the crowd supporting the students as a sign of solidarity. At one point in the six hour demonstration, the students asked all black and indigenous people to sit on a socially distanced X on Main Street, to be visible, to take up space, and to acknowledge that our lives were important. And if you look at the picture, you can see both Jessica and I sitting there. As we sat on this street, periodically following the youth's instructions and participating in protest chants, inspired by the energy of the youth, we spoke about our families both mothers of Black and Indigenous boys, of course, Jessica to El Salvador, and also about the field of gender-based violence, which is not only our paid work, but it's also our life's work and passion. It was in this act of active resistance where students achieved their goal of having police removed from schools that our study idea was realized. What a relatively small group of racialized youth accomplished that day was remarkable. They challenged a 19 year program in a city that has the highest rate of police reported hate crimes in Canada at 17.1%. This number is likely higher given the legacy of distrust for police with racialized communities and illustrates the macro level context of how racism and discrimination are experienced in Hamilton, Ontario. And at the time of this protest, black communities and their allies in Hamilton were in a heightened state of agitating. Earlier in the same year, a Black youth program was paused during Black History Month at a local high school. And as you can see by some of the science students are carrying, there were other experiences of racism. Football players were being called cotton pickers, and the word nigger was found written in the snow. The letters large enough to fill the football field. Following this, our communities were angered and devastated by the murder of George Floyd. We did not need another black man murdered to prove that anti-black racism exists. And this is not to eclipse the lives that have been lost here in Canada at the uh, hands of police. But I think that the, the images that we saw for George Floyd is what galvanized the world in terms of recognizing what was going on. 
These public examples of dehumanization remain the goal of colonization and a critical tactic for continued violence on Black and Indigenous bodies. And all of these events occurred during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. The city's hesitation to acknowledge and address systemic racism during the peak of the pandemic has resulted in Hamilton having one of the lowest vaccination rates in Ontario, even though global preliminary reports revealed racial disparities in COVID-19 cases and fatalities, and the increased risk for gender-based violence had been clearly made on a global scale. And so I have provide these events to illustrate the volatile and violent environment that we as Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities live in on an everyday basis in Hamilton and elsewhere. I also provide these events because it continues to show our agency, our unwillingness to remain silent or to be invisible. And these choices connect us to our histories, but also speak to our futures as the next generation are the ones leading the charge. I was on a call with Black community leaders earlier this week because, again, as what I explained, the events that have gone on in Hamilton. And one leader said that the students have become the teachers, and this is how we continue. This is how we survive. And so it is these realities that not only require but demand of us to ground our theoretical analysis in anti-colonial Indigenous women and Black feminist critiques. We do this consciously to center ourselves within our work, to resist the colonial project of our own dehumanization and marginalization, and to recognize that protecting our energy is an act of survival. And there are some key theoretical points that connect many Black and Indigenous writers that are visible within our work. First, it is that theory is not abstract. It arises from the everyday experiences of Black, Indigenous, and racialized women. And because of that, it always begins from the point of difference that is acknowledged and celebrated. We are also theorizing from a position of power, even though we recognize the intersections of our oppressions. But in recognizing the intersections of those oppressions, we are able to name it. And when we name it, we speak about it and we write about it. And through those process of speaking and writing, we are liberated because we are also promoting our own healing. And so when we think about the gender-based violence sector and in, and in particular women's organizations, they offer an interesting site to examine equity, diversity and inclusion and anti-oppression policies and practices. We know that the risk and exposure to violence is heightened for Indigenous, Black, and racialized communities, particularly those who are two-spirited LGBTQ and women with disabilities. And through our own experiences, we also know that many of us come to this work as survivors of violence. And so it is important that women are not exposed to further discrimination and violence when access accessing women's organizations within the gender-based violence sector. One way to address this is to ensure that racialized women workers who are often the only racialized worker or one of few in organizations are in a safe working environment free from discrimination. And so with that in mind, the goals of our research are to first support those women who are doing the work of serving their own communities. It's important to document their experiences of racism while working in EDI and AO policy led women's organizations. And recognizing that these women are leaders and knowledge keepers, even though they may, may feel silenced, was why we also wanted to explore the development of a racialized service provider led system of accountability uh, within the sector. And so when we thought about our research design, we knew that to engage in this work meant that we had to protect our energy. And so to honor our ways of knowing, we created an elder community advisory board. In our project, elder is not synonymous with age, but it represents perspectives that are not necessarily captured on our research team. The creation of our advisory board is the celebration of difference that I spoke about earlier. I asked Janice to provide her wisdom and experiences to our research. Danielle asked Lyndon to provide his wisdom and experiences to our research. And Jessica asked Sandra to provide her wisdom. We ask those within our community to support us, but to also hold us accountable by providing perspectives that we may not have considered. However, our research design has not come without its challenges. The reality is that these elders contribute to our communities in so many ways, and still they try to find time to carve out supporting our research. 
Our work with our elders does not fit into a neat frame of calling a meeting and everyone showing up. It has meant being flexible and rethinking what our ask is to people who are running organizations, caring for get grandchildren, and standing up for people within our community that have somehow been deemed less worthy, as I mentioned before. Protecting our energy through reclaiming space and power has also meant that our original vision of Danielle leading talking circles changed when Danielle accepted an opportunity to develop curriculum and improve engagement for Indigenous youth at Mohawk College. We, we celebrated her win. Her perspectives, ideas, and energy were instrumental to the development of the research grant ideas and to many of the discussions and problem solving that arose in the early days of the research project. So we had to create space to work through what a new working relationship would look and feel like without reservation, recognizing that her first priority must always be to invest in her own community, particularly when the impact of her work in her new role is focused solely on Indigenous students. We also made the conscious decision to include the voices and perspectives of organizational whiteness in an effort to shoulder the burden often carried by racialized workers. In capturing these perspectives, it's one way that we name the source of oppression for racialized women within the gender-based violence uh, sector. Here, I think about the work of Elizabeth Archuleta when she states that healing and empowerment cannot take place until we identify the many sources of our oppression. We also used a community-based uh, qualitative research design. And one of the tenets of community-based research is that it begins with forging a trusting relationship with the community who will engage in research. However, for Danielle, Jessica, and I, we came together for this project because we knew what each other's values were and our communities um, and our commitments, excuse me, to supporting our communities. While this project marks the first formal collaboration between the three of us, we had attempted to connect on other projects and share a mutual social justice lens of calling for a safer Hamilton for everyone. I also want to touch on the sense of collective ownership, which is one of the reasons that it felt unsettling to present the process of our research for the first time without the others, also because this has been a deeply personal process. This is why I have included the pictures of those who are important in each aspect of the research on the slides to illustrate the, the, toge the togetherness of our work. While the research idea began with the three of us, we believe collective ownership can be a transformative process. We envision that ownership of this research is shared with those who this work is for, which are racialized women workers within the gender-based violence sector. And we've created that in the design by the system of accountability that we hope will be led by them. We also see ownership shared with the research team and the elder advisory committee. Through the data collection phase of this research, the idea of ownership also expanded beyond our vision and was realized in the everyday actions of those who were not directly connected to our research. These small but significant actions were instrumental in moving our research forward. For example, the project coordinator for the Hamilton Gender-Based Violence Network sent out reminder emails to organizations offered um, to introduce me uh, to women's organizations who had not responded to recruitment, recruitment efforts through email. She also gave me advice on the best meetings to attend for greater engagement of organizations as we began data collection during the summer when many people were on vacation. She had no affiliation to our research team, but showed a willingness to initiate different recruitment strategies with her knowledge of organizations and the culture within the gender-based violence network. Her support of our work was instrumental in gaining access to different organizations. We were also intentional about our recruitment process to ensure that we provided the opportunities to racialize student researchers. Our job descriptions were advertised on the Faculty of Health Research website and was sent for distribution to the Harriet Tubman Institute and the Center for Indigenous Student Services at York University. We also shared our job calls with a network of Caribbean faculty and an Indigenous faculty member also at York University. Through these efforts, we received 27 applications from highly qualified racialized students and graduates from across Canada for three research positions. 
In this process, we were reminded of the barriers racialized communities face in accessing professional and academic opportunities. We had internationally trained applicants, including an academic professor from South Asia and social service professionals, such as a psychologist, social workers, and teachers from continental Africa, who were seeking opportunities to gain uh, Canadian research experience. The number of applications illustrates that there is no shortage of talented and qualified individuals within racialized communities. Rather, if academic institutions and principal investigators are having difficulty recruiting underrepresented communities on their research projects or within their institutions, it would be important to consider whether the research speaks to the communities they are aiming to recruit, whether or not the institution and or research environment is safe, and how connected principal investigators are to the community. Danielle and I worked together to narrow down the applications for those who would receive an interview. We considered for those who, um, we considered a combination of factors when deciding who would work with us, including their substantive areas, research experience and lived experience with gender-based violence personally and or working within the sector. Aside from these areas, Danielle and I also relied on the energy or the vibe that we felt in the interview. This tacit knowledge and unspoken feeling that is often captured in phrases um, such as my spirit didn't take to him or to her or to them in the Caribbean is what Danielle and I drew upon in our decision making about research team members. It was important for us to draw on this cultural knowledge given the nature of our research and the commitment to center ourselves within our work. In actuality, this knowledge is always within us but we've been taught that there are other more concrete ways of decision-making, particularly in an academic setting. Therefore, we gave ourselves permission to ground our decision-making in an energy that has often guided our elders and ancestors. As Helen Timothy wrote, African spirituality was considered necessary to hone the power and control for repeated rebellions and revolutions in the Caribbean throughout slavery. Simply the consciousness of having gods other than those possessed by the enslavers was of course tremendously mentally liberating and served to inspire the desire for revolt. Similarly, in indigenous cultures, the spirit is necessary for balanced well-being and connects all living things. Danielle felt connected to Marsha when she read that some of her work as a linguist focused on the work of a Nancy. Danielle wanted to hear more about this from Marsha, and it was that connection or recognition of her own culture within Marsha's work that provided a sense of belonging to Danielle. And so building our team, utilizing our energy knowledge liberated us to trust our spirit in the important work of building our research team. I was also aware that once our research team was built that there were inevitable power dynamics within the team. We hired team members with different levels of education and experience for roles that had distinct responsibilities. We made this decision to create mentorship opportunities within the team. However, we were aware that this model could also create hierarchical working relationships that could stifle creativity and mentorship to an academic frame. With this in mind, Jessica, Danielle, and I agreed that establishing a baseline set of working principles could be the starting point to building a respectful work environment amongst all team members, including us. It was important that I led by example as the lead researcher and also read and signed the organizational policies. Given that the collaboration for this research study was with Sasha, a feminist women's organization, we chose to use the package of policies normally provided to new hires. Although power dynamics continue to exist within our research team, working exclusively with racialized women researchers has been a welcome space of safety and refuge where we speak freely without having to qualify our statements. Therefore, mentorship has been reciprocal and family oriented in a way that occurs amongst black women and racialized women and transcends academia. We also received a relatively small grant, which meant that the total funds allotted to each research team member would not be sufficient to employ all team members on a full-time basis. The payment options for part-time research assistance within the university setting is either bi-weekly timesheets or monthly payments. Bi-weekly timesheets are based upon the number of hours research assistants complete each week, which can fluctuate, making it difficult for financial planning. 
And if we had split the payments equally over 12 months, it would have resulted in an insignificant amount of money. We were mindful of Ontario's increasingly high cost of living, the insecurity of part-time work and the emotional and mental toll it can have on a person's well-being. Therefore, we chose to elevate these realities over our need to track team members' work in relation to their pay and the relationship we were building in our team. Danielle and I trusted in the collective commitment and ownership of this work by the team, knowing that the energy we sensed from each individual was not wrong. This is what we consider as a relational compensation in a research environment. And now that we had our research team created, we turned to our recruitment strategies. And it's difficult to fully capture the emotional labor invested by Danielle, Jessica, and I in our meetings to discuss organizational buy-in for our research. And I would say that Jessica shouldered more of this labor than Danielle and I, because she is one of few executive directors of color within the gender-based violence sector in Hamilton, and is also a partner in this research. She knew the environment that we were entering, and hence we had a couple of meetings, text messages, and phone calls to ensure the language was palatable. We often asked ourselves, how do you disrupt whiteness when you need to get in to disrupt it? As racialized women engaging in this work, we are often challenged with monitoring our language, making decisions on where and how we want to bend so that the research will occur without losing ourselves in the process. Our grant application captured the essence of what we aim to achieve in the language of our choosing, but we were aware that the language could be perceived as threatening and could hinder participant recruitment. In this sense, we had to choose the language that we would ensure that would ensure our own survival in this work, to look ahead at what we are aiming to achieve and have that sustain us as we make these sacrifices that are needed to respond to the taken for granted security that white privilege affords. What you are seeing here is one example of how we changed our language in the project. We changed the title of our project from strengthening women's organizations to understanding women's organizations, because we felt the word to understand is less intimidating than to strengthen. As I mentioned before, taking these extra steps is emotional labor. Therefore, we gave ourselves time to process our emotions and resolved our frustrations by agreeing that to better understand the sector will strengthen it. And so we began this work to support racialized women in the gender-based violence sector who experience racism under EDI and AO policy-led women's organizations. We knew that the lived experiences of many racialized women go unrecognized, their stories silenced. This intention sustained the fire in our bellies to work through some of the tensions that arose in this project. We also believe that a universal energy has recognized our intention and supported this project in everyday ways that have been important, such as the project coordinator within the gender-based violence network that we mentioned above. However, this project has also given more to us than we could have imagined. We created a network of women, a supportive and safe space that has sustained several of us through difficult life moments. We have realized that this work has offered us a mirror in which to examine ourselves and interactions within, with each other as we also seek to support women in the gender-based violence sector. Through deep introspection, we know that our efforts to unearth the stories of women who have been silenced must also mean that we stand in our own truth and tell our stories to liberate ourselves. And with that being said, I would like to invite Marsha to tell her story. Um, and I believe that she is now in the room, um, but uh, her name on here is MH. <laughs> so you may not know that that is Marsha. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing here for a minute. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Do we have, have Marsha? I do. I'm oh, here. Oh, Good okay. afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. We can hear and see Thank Marcia. you so much, Ruth. Okay. Thank you so much. Now, I started this project, and I think it is important in terms of the contextualization of where I was when I started. Um, I started it at, at the lived experience of the disconnect between EDI policy on paper and cultural change within institutions. I had actually come back to Canada in March 2021, and I had taken up um, a position in a, in a very prestigious institution to lead their EDI planning and implementation. 
found myself on the end of some very significant microaggression, a very, a very unsavory work environment, and was fired uh, pretty much very, very shortly after all of that. And so when I saw this project advertised, it was not just um, project engagement that I was looking for. I was also very much looking for a lifeline. And I went into this project because of my experience with, with the EDI space that I, that I returned to in 2021, being very skeptical because the individual that I'd worked for in that other space was also a woman. Um, the difference, though, was that it was not a racialized woman. And I think one of the things that, that made me give this project a thought, made me send a, a, a CV to it, is because of that fact. It was actually a, a Black woman lead researcher, and that had a significance for me. Now, in terms of, of the Black woman lead researcher um, that I met, I think it was the embodiment of the recognition of, of academies as privileged spaces, and then that Black lead researcher, and of course I'm talking about, about Ruth Rodney, but trying to do it in a way that she's not uncomfortable because she is in the room. Um, I think it was, um, you know, her willingness to accept that an academy is a privileged space. And it was clear to me that she had made her choice to go against the grain of what the status quo perhaps is, or is perceived to be versus being just in the maintenance of the status quo. Because really when, when Ruth hired me for this project, I think I was very close to desolate financially. And I was also flirting with, with homelessness. And so in terms of transform, transformative research, it really is the point at which you sit back and ask. And it really is the point at which I have sat back and asked, would you hire a homeless researcher? Because really and truly, when we talk about changing the space and inviting different identities into the academy, these are really the hard and real questions that we're asking. I think we've been able to be true to this project because of what COVAC 2015 calls in part politics of identity. None of us will, came to this work as simply researchers looking for a way to fulfill our research requirements. Many of us knew the work, we could spot the power dynamics, we knew how to integrate and be safe space in the work. And I think this is what has unleashed the power of the participants that we've been able to talk to and interact with um, in the space as we've done the research. But it is also what has unleashed the power of, of the transformation in the space for ourselves as researchers. And of course, I think just the fact that Ruth is willing to lead by example, even in something as simple as asking me to speak my own story in my own words here, as opposed to her just reading it or, or it being an integration into the script that, that she's um, delivering today. And then the final reflection that I wanna leave is that sometimes we are able to, to create superficial safe space. And I think one of the things that, that, that I am taking away from, from this project is that this is not a superficial safe space. We have checked each other within this space several times. So I remember when, when and I think Ruth would have spoken to this in, in her articulation of the project, we started with the number 45 as the amount of individuals we wanted to interface with in the project. And for reasons which um, I think Ruth would have gone through, we, we, we weren't able to maintain that, that number of 45. And I remember at one point just asking Ruth, why are, we, why are we so invested in this number of 45? And in going through the reason, I, I think there were not necessarily reasons of transformation or even reasons that, that needed to be there for um, the research to be sound, but there were um, reasons that were given to us by the space and the demands of the academy. Um, and so that was one, one time I think that Ruth and I were able to have a frank discussion in terms of where we were taking the research and why we were taking it there. And then as recently as Monday, when we were doing the financial tallying, 
um, you know, I, I wanted one of our, our junior researchers to be a part of the, project, the, the process. And Ruth said to me, but why? Why does she need to be a part of the process? You can just do it. And I reflected and I was like, yeah, I really can just do it. And so I think we've been able to create a space where, like Ruth said, we speak freely. And speaking freely doesn't necessarily always mean that we agree or that we always coming from, from the same position, but we have created a space where we always can feel like we're respected and heard. And this is how our young researchers in this research are experienced in the space. And I hope that that is what will determine their long-term investment and engagement in transformative research, because it takes perhaps a little more work than quote-unquote traditional research has done. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, um, Marcia. And yes, we can speak about the um, numbers within the research. I actually didn't include that to this point, but we can talk about that in the um, question and answer uh, period. Um, and so um, really, again, um, when we speak about it being a, a transformative process, um, there are so many uh, things that we had experienced uh, throughout um, the, the process. As I had mentioned to you, um, my sister had passed away uh, when this work was ongoing. And what I've learned um, in that process is having to release the need of keeping up with the productivity of academia, um, keeping to timelines of um, uh, completing the work, what it meant is that I had to give the work to the research team um, and, and trust that um, it is okay to not have to um, uh, continue at the same speed and, pay, and pace. And so really in many ways, um, we're still continuing to think about and analyze what it has been to go through this process, but we really wanted to document some of the key uh, decisions that we've made because really in this process of speaking about it and writing and listening to one another, but also you listening to me and me being able to speak in this space is really emancipatory because it is, is telling our story of what it was in, in um, throughout our research process that we, we are still in. Um, and so when I think about moving anti-oppression work forward, I think that emotion is method. There is so much power in pain. And really we look at from the start of this project, it was within resistance um, where it emerged. And so there's also a vulnerability um, that I also think is method and humility I say is method. And when we think about anti-oppression within the research field, it's always important the planning which we are asked to do when we are um, applying for research grants, but it is also very much about the response. And, and and when I say that it's not only about action, it is about bold action. And so I, I would ask if, um, again, as Marcia said, uh, would you hire a um, homeless researcher? And what does it mean to support that person? And so I, I think that I would leave two questions here for everyone to ponder on. And really it is that, do you know what your research team members are going through? And do you know um, their stories? And I think that is the, the way that we um, actually see anti-oppression in praxis, the ways that we have thought about ensuring that we created a safe working environment for research assistants, as well as ourselves, and responding to all of the changes that had uh, come up within our process, even though we had created a safe space within our working environment as researchers, we are still interacting with a system um, that ha has been oppressive, and the multiple perspectives of all of our identities has meant that, um, you know, we, we interacted in ways that we didn't know, we could not have foreseen. And so that is where I think that I will um, stop there. Um, and hopefully I have been within the time <laughs> that I was supposed to be. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Ruth. Perfect timing. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. 
Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is open it up for questions and comments and discussion. We'll keep track of um, things that are going on in the chat um, and we'll bring these questions forward. Um, please feel free to you know, use the raised hand. We've got over 100 people on the, on the call today. So over, use the raised hand or unmute yourself. And, um, and please, if, if, if possible, if you could turn your camera on um, when you're asking a question, that would be super. And uh, we'll get started here. If you have questions, you can post them into the chat. I'm gonna keep track of what's going on. Lots of, just while we're waiting for the first couple of questions and hands up, lots of um, support and, and gratitude for your talk, Ruth, and also for uh, Marsha and her, um, the way in which she shared her story, Martha. Um, let's see, let me check for questions here. We have a question, Amy has got her hand up. Amy Gajaria. Hi everyone, it's Amy. Hello, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Um, as others have said, you making like visible some of the labor that you put in and the power dynamics that are present. Um, I wondered a little bit about the piece around kind of the vibe, like in your hiring process. Um, I 100% get where that comes from, particularly in racialized communities and how, you know, we talk to each other, we understand each other. I wonder how to reconcile that with the message I give in hiring in general to avoid like bias and implicit bias that we don't go on a vibe because that recreates like, um, oppressive practices and discrimination against racialized people in a mixed environment. So I just wondered, you know, I had some questions about that. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Amy. Well, I think as well, it is not that um, all of our decision making is solely based on that. It is in connection with all of the other um, uh, uh, sort of points that we are looking for within um, research, um, within the research assistance. And so it was part of what it was, but um, because again, we were focused on um, speaking with a number of people who um, all came to the space with um, uh, incredibly uh, excellent uh, um, resumes, we also felt that what we drew on was sort of the, um, in understanding what anti-oppression would look like in practice. And so there are certain things that we were listening for in terms of in the questions that we posed and also drawing on body language. And so when we left the interviews, um, we it was part of the, the um, process of decision making, but not the sole process of decision making to a point that it wouldn't be that well, it was on that we didn't like the person, but it was more along the lines of, does this person embody and feel um, uh, what is necessary in terms of engaging in that bold um, action that would be necessary within the research team to be able to respond in ways um, uh, in terms of seeing the challenges that would arise. And so I, I would say that it's a combination um, and not just only that, but I think so many times we're sort of told that um, that is not useful or it's sort of spoken down to, um, but really oftentimes trusting that instinct and gut is what often um, helps to move us forward and move the work forward. Thank you, Amy. Um, one of the questions that's posted here is, um, uh, asking, people are very interested in this humility as method. Mm -hmm. And um, and just wondering if you might comment a little bit more on that as we kind of sit with that for a bit. Yeah, and, and so I think really where that arises from is that I also recognize that I am in a position of privilege. And, and as the researcher coming into the field, I choose purposely to stay grounded um, and engaged within the community, because oftentimes it helps you to realize and see those blind spots that you may not have realized. And so when I talk about um, uh, in terms of humility as method, um, even Lyndon within our uh, one of our meetings had asked us, why are you using the acronym BIPOC? And we use the acronym because for very practical reasons of 
the Shirk application, our initial um, uh, uh, title was far too long. But what he explained to us was that there are some Indigenous communities that may feel that they are not represented in that. And so whereas we thought that we had thought about everything that we needed to ensure that the research was um, open and responsive for other people, we recognized that um, in essence, you have to be open um, to seeing where and recognizing and hearing where your blind spots are parts are, excuse me. Um, and so that is why I say that humility is also method in terms of recognizing that you don't always know everything and that the process of learning is definitely reciprocal. And so even though I, I'm within and, and uh, the uh, team as a researcher, there's also so much that I can uh, learn. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Janice Jackson now has a question. And Janice is part of our team of elders. <laughs> oh, Janice, is your mic on? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Hi. Um, first, let me thank Ruth for representing the team um, so well. It's been a privilege of mine to be involved in this process and um, very humbling, actually, because what it does, it shows that uh, it shows the importance of involving persons who are going to be researched in this whole process and learning from them. The fact that the process started from action at the community level, I think is very critical. As, as a, a former um, university professor, I recognize that so much, is, so much time is spent on projecting our own views rather than those of the persons who um, we are going to be interacting with. And I think that this is really a liberating way of moving forward in terms of understanding people's reality, not only listening to them and recording what they have to say, but giving them an opportunity to speak for themselves. Um, that I think is, is, is very, um, very revolutionary. And the academy needs to be revolutionized. I think that um, too, much, too much structure has been put in, which is not necessarily helping people to really understand what's going on in the world, what's going on with their lives. So um, congratulations on that. Um, the, the, going back to the whole process of the recruitment, I think we have to spend more time focusing on, on our own gut, um, recognizing that we are all connected by, it, by, by the universe and um, uh, being being able to tap into the energies that are flowing uh, without being constrained by um, what people might say if they think this is what we're doing. Um, because there are times when we miss uh, misinformation that's coming to us uh, uh, through through the, the, the way um, our, intu our intuition is really important. And I don't think that we've been encouraged enough to rely on our intuition in, in moving forward. That, uh, there's some people who I think would stay in the academy because it's the academy when there's something telling them it's time to go. Um, so it, I, mean, I, I think those are some points that I really wanted to, to share at this point in time. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Janice. And if there's anybody else on the research team, then definitely make yourself um, uh, put your hand up. Um, Ruth made a specific uh, request to make sure we're paying attention to you in reflection of the process that she uses and in being really inclusive. So we definitely want to hear from you. Um, just before I go to some hands up, there was a question earlier about somebody else who was a former student, Leslie Williams of Denise Castaldo's and, um, and she asks, what recommendations based on your current work do you have in minimizing the power imbalance among research teams with the PI when the PI is not from a racialized community? Hmm. I'm just gonna look at it here. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I would say is um, really what's been helpful to us is having an advisory board. 
um, ensuring that we have uh, other voices from the community um, that can help to keep um, sort of hold us accountable. Um, and, and yes, I worked with Denise and I think there are, are several um, people that Denise has worked with who are racialized, but one thing I can say with working with Denise is the acknowledgement of the um, power imbalances and addressing that is also something that I've learned from her. She has been someone that has used um, the position of her privilege throughout my um, uh, doctoral work to really support me in ways that um, uh, you know, goes beyond what is asked of a supervisor. And so I think that when I talk about, um, you know, the relational um, compensation, that is one way to think and move beyond or not move beyond, because I even think that still within our um, research team, there are power imbalances. I am the, the lead researcher. Um, and so although we have tried to um, sort of um, recognize and, and maybe decrease them, I don't think that they can ever fully be um, completely eliminated. And so I think part of it is recognizing what your um, what, where you stand within that, um, that relationship, and then how you use the power that you have um, in ways that supports your team um, to move forward. Thank you, Ruth. We have a hand up from Nior. Hello, I forgot to move my uh, little sticky. Um, thank you so much for that presentation, Ruth, and, and to the team for everything that you all shared and all the work that you've done. Um, I'm like taking a lot of time now just to reflect on everything that you shared. Um, I think one of the, the big points that is really sticking out to me from your presentation is the emotion is method um, point that you had made. And I wanted to go back to uh, one of the, the things you mentioned around the challenges associated with having to monitor language that's used around research. So you mentioned how you had to change the title of your research study from you know structuring to understanding. And I wondered if you could speak more to the um, like how to strike that balance of you know making the sacrifices that you might need to make to make sure that the research can go ahead, but also not sacrificing it so much that you're losing like that that essence of your research. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that's a great question and, and it was something that really we had to resolve in discussions um, amongst uh, the three of us. Um, and so really what it came down to was us considering um, what the end goal of the research was um, and looking at what the word actually meant and what it could lead to. Um, and so actually, you know, I would say that initially when we went to begin the recruitment, I did not catch that. It was actually Jessica who was the one who said, wait a minute, guys, hold on here. We need to look at how we are um, presenting this because she felt that some of the organizations would believe from seeing strengthening that we're coming from a position that something is already wrong. And so really what it was, was us um, making a decision, sitting with it, thinking about it, discussing it, um, and then sort of also being mindful of, um, you know, again, the goal of the research and what it would mean if we chose to stop at this point, which was not an option. Um, but I can also say that there were also some hard lines that we made. Um, and actually, Denise and Marsha, um, I spoke to about this, that one of the organizations had asked to see um, my research questions, my interview guide before they would send the recruitment flyers out. And I had to ask why um, would that happen? And initially, when I had, I remember telling Marsha about it, I had said to her, oh, you know, I think that this is probably a process to protect the organization. Um, and she was the one who really said to me, but for what reason? And so in speaking with her, as well as Denise, that was actually a decision that I, I took a hard line on and I said that I would not send um, it because it's my intellectual property. And then also we had gone through a full ethics approval and what would happen if they did not like a question? Would it then mean that they were not going to send out the recruitment um, flyers to the, um, to the organization? And so I think that really what it will come to is um, for you to sort of decide within each moment 
what um, like thinking about what implications it has for your research and then also with yourself. Um, and I think also making sure that you write down um, what it is that you feel so you can really think about it more deeply um, moving forward. And that was something um, that was very important to us, which is why we made sure that we documented all of the steps that we've taken thus far, because I don't necessarily think that there's always um, sort of a guide of how to do um, this work. Thank you. Thank These you. are great questions and also um, really nice that you're taking the time. People are appreciating the depth of your responses, Ruth. Oh, okay. um, I see there's a hand up, but just before I get to that, um, there's another question from Robin in the chat. If you have time, could you speak to the challenges of using intuition versus unconscious biases in making some hiring decisions? Okay, yeah, and I think this was something also as well um, that Amy had asked. Um, and so uh, just to say that it is not that it is the only decision um, or this decision making tool that we use, we used, but it was not something that we um, chose to suppress. And so once we had um, spoken uh, to, uh, particularly there was an interview that we had that both Danielle and I, after listening to uh, the responses um, within the questions that we were asking, there was a, a gut feeling that in some ways, um, this person didn't fully understand what it was that we were, um, what would be required for the research. And so um, it's not necessarily that it is the only decision making tool that we use, but we choose, we chose not to um, have uh, to sort of suppress or not listen to um, that feeling that we had within um, our, our, our um, interviews. Great. And, and also too, sorry, just one thing, Polly, I think also to, to sort of draw on what Janice said um, in terms of that, you know, it is something that, you know, it, it is sort of innate within us. And I don't think that it's something that should um, necessarily be seen as a weakness or something that um, uh, could necessarily uh, cause a, a bias in some ways, because I think that also if you are looking at, um, a CV, there's also potentially um, things that you might look at that might also cause an implicit bias. And so I don't necessarily think that just using um, sort of that energy um, only um, calls for those certain um, sort of, I guess, cautions to, to, to be aware of. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, just before, Annika, I see your hand up. I'm just before, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to Marsha because she's one of the research team and she shared her story and, and maybe she has a follow up to what Ruth was talking about. And I so, think Anika, if it's Anika, it might be Anika from our team. <laughs> oh, sorry, Anika. Here I am. Uh, Anika, you go. Be. And Marsha, you go. You can, uh, Anika, let's go to you first then. Sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity here to recognize that as much as this project has been, you know, very transformative, the research process itself um, is deeply, it is so deeply reflective and introspective. And I think that that just adds so much more value to the work that we're doing. Um, and even the engagement with each of the participants and again, it just speaks to the space and energy that it has been intentionally created by such an amazing team. And I think it speaks well to um, the leadership, right? And so yes, there are power dynamics and that is inevitable, but we have, um, I believe we have really been intentional about ensuring that the space is safe enough for us to be candid, to share our real struggles. And that has just been very much a learning experience and deeply reflective. And I think it's just um, something that if can be replicated should be because we always, you know, produce better, work better and are happier when we are coming to our work and everything we do with authenticity. So I just would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our team and to all that have joined um, to really listen candidly about um, this project. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anika. Thanks. Uh, Marsha, did you have something? I don't see your hand up anymore. I just want to make sure I don't miss you before I go on. 
Thank you. Just very quickly, I, I, what Ruth was talking about just now in terms of the hiring process, it brought me back to a question that was in the chat about um, emotion as method. And if, if, and, and this is just me, you know, thinking through that and trying to, as Ruth would say, code switch around it. I think emotion as method is about deductive research. I think it is about intuitive processes and in allowing the time for intuitive processes. One of the Western relics, I think, in research is this rigid adherence to a timeline, this rigid process of the beginning of the research, the collection of the data, the analysis of the data, the reporting of the data. I think that emotion as method demands that there is that time and space to move backward and forward and backward and forward and to throw whole parts of the research out if they don't fit to, to create something else that fits better especially if you're serving the community so i think it is intuition um intuitive process and reflectivity and then i think as well it is just the the strength to do all of that within academies that are still not premium in that as the way that good research is done. Thank you, Marsha. I love this um, relics of research. I think that's something that I'll, I'm sure we can make a big list about those. Um, there's a hand up from Matthew Strain. Yes, hi. Thank you so much, Ruth, for this, and, and Martha. Uh, this has been a great, great, great talk. I wanted to, so sort of two things, and you decide where you want to take them, if you want to take them anywhere. Um, thank you so much for bringing up both emotion and vulnerability. I feel like that, like many people, has really struck a chord. And I, so I wondered, because um, you were talking, and I know it's where you are in your process right now, about the emotion work or emotional labor that your team has had to do. and I. That and that you know people have to do, and I'm wondering how you may or may not be trying to um, get at that through the the actual work of, of the participants too, like what emotional work they might have to do both in this process, but also in what you're directly asking them about. If you thought about that, um, and then the other question was uh, you had talked at one point, and I might have sort of missed the endpoint, but about kind of putting. Uh, like being able to identify white supremacy and sort of how it works in different ways in particular, uh, in a particular way. And also I thought you had talked about something about making sure that work is like not always put on um, people like racialized people. And so I just, I think I didn't quite get it because you've just been dropping so many pearls. And so I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about that or, and or I guess, coming from my own place um, as like a white cis researcher on um, uh, teams that have multiple racialized people, like where, where, how can I help with that without centering myself? Like how can I help with, of, of putting white supremacy? And that might be a bigger question that, uh, yeah. Anyways, sorry, I'm not that articulate right now, but that's what, what it is. <laughs> Thanks. No, no problem. So thank you for both your questions. So to answer your first question in terms of um, the emotional labor of the participants, it's something that we had actually planned for and thought about um, in the research design. And so um, what we actually have is at the end of our research is a space um, that we are going to present the results solely to um, racialized workers. And so in that space, we you know, have accounted for to ensure that there are um, uh, you know, child care, that we have food, that it really reflects um, a, a space of community. Um, and then also uh, one thing that we had just sort of stumbled on was um, in speaking to someone regarding trying to recruit um, racialized workers within the sector, um, I ended up having a conversation with one person um, and I could sense that she really wanted to um, speak about what was going on, but was scared and needed to ensure um, that the space was safe, that um, her identity uh, would remain anonymous because of course, many of the organizations, there's high turnover, particularly now working with COVID, um, through COVID, these organizations who typically are underfunded um, are, are having a, a tremendous amount more work. 
Um, and so through that process, we also realized that we needed to um, provide ways of supporting um, uh, uh, participants emotionally. Um, and what Jessica had actually suggested was creating um, sort of small um, uh, giveaways of affirmation cards um, that sort of have messages of hope and strength. The other thing that I should say is that in recognizing the emotional toll, there's also um, Dr. Clara um, Pratt who is on here, and we actually are um, have submitted um, uh, a, a project in terms of where um, workers would have the ability to sort of um, be engaged in workshops where they can work through some of the um, emotions and feelings or whatever they would like to in an artistic um, uh, way. Um, and so I, I was really excited to be able to collaborate with Clara because it means that there's an opportunity for workers to be able to um, have an extended space um, to really just think about um, and focus on what is most um, needed for them uh, for their own um, sort of uh, safety. So there's a number of ways that we've thought about it. Oh, Janice has her hand raised. Hi, I think one of the um, important things that has come out in this process is a commitment to documenting the process, the research process, um, which is often not part of the research that we do, as well as um, something else that I think is, that is, is critical is for the researchers themselves to engage in uh, an understanding of what it is that they're actually researching and sort of putting themselves in the place of the those being researched. Because uh, sometimes we do research that's related to our head, but not related to our heart. And I think we have to do a lot more research that's really, our research should be related to our heart as we're working along. Uh, if we focus on collecting data um, and, and manipulating the data, we are, we are excluding ourselves from that process. And I think that we need to be more ingrained in the process um, and, and recognize that we are being affected by it and we are affecting um, whatever it is we're going to find and we're going to report on. So I think that the, the, the looking at that, the process and the impact of the process on the researcher, I think is, is particularly important as well. And I found that as a, a very strong part of this, this research process. Thanks, Janice. Thanks, Janice. Um, one, just one of the comments that's in the chat or a, a note is um, Tenzin is just reminding us that uh, in 2022, CQ is planning a workshop uh, that may be of interest to students on the issue of power and politics of doctoral education for Black, Indigenous, and other racialized students. So if you're interested in that, please stay tuned um, and check out the CQ website. Um, Ruth, there's been a couple of questions through the chat, or not really questions, but just sort of comments asking if um, if you've had a chance to do any writing in this area so that, that we can kind of use that um, uh, or, you know, get a little deeper in terms of your thinking, either on your method or any of sort of the preliminary um, processes that you're talking about. Is there anything that you can refer us to? Well, um, nothing that is fully completed. <laughs> Um, we're right now actually in the process of um, we've documented sort of our our journey to date. And so actually, um, I've sent it to Marsha um, uh, just uh, a few days ago. And so we're hoping to um, submit that um, soon for publication within the new year. Um, and, and, you know, perhaps we might think more um, deeply even about writing um, a paper specifically focused on emotion as method. Um, um, and, uh, but I, I would say that now as we've started to, um, you know, we've actually looked at one transcription as a team. Um, and as we sort of move through that process of analysis, I also think that there are going to be um, other um, points that have come up. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is that we used um, Sasha's resources 
um, to sort of um, have the starting point of a respectful work environment, but also within our research, we're examining um, what the policies say to what the experiences are of um, uh, women working within the sector. And so one of the, the notes that I had actually, um, you know, said to Marsha within the paper is that, you know, now we have our own uh, anti-oppression policies that we've used within an organization. Um, and it will be interesting to sort of think about um, perhaps how those may have impacted or what role it plays within our environment as researchers, um, and also comparing that to what we are seeing uh, women speaking about within the, the sector. And so I will say that you know, again, as we, we came to this work wanting to ensure that we um, supported women within the sector, it really has been um, a process of reflection and an analysis of our own um, work as researchers and also um, the network that we have created within the environment um, of the research team and the elders. Um, so yeah, the work continues, the analysis continues. <laughs> Thank you. Janice, I see your hand up. I'm not sure if uh, you have a follow up or if that's from earlier. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is just a, a, I hope you'll get a chance afterwards, Ruth, to read what's going on in the chat. It's kind of exploding mostly with people just really appreciative and also um, Lots of things that you're leaving people with. And I might just, um, unless I'm missing anybody, Tenzin will let me know. I might just um, ask one, one final thing of you before we end today. And that's, um, you know, what do you, what do you want us to leave with today? What's, what's the message that, uh, you know, we're all sort of percolating and have been taking lots of notes. And is there something that you would like us to reflect on as we sort of end today? Um, yes, yeah, so I think that, you know, when we think about anti oppression in practice, it really is about bold action and thinking about the way that we are creating our research teams and the, the, the ways in which that we support each other through research um, and sort of recognizing and remembering that research assistants are part time workers. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you have not been in the space um, uh, or sort of being able to understand their experience, um, I would hope that most people here would take away to really ask their research assistants how they're doing, what they're going through, and to make the work um, more than just the research. Um, that, it, you know, the, the research team has an opportunity to truly be a transformative space. And I, I see that Danielle was unable to um, come on. Um, but what she had also said as um, an Indigenous woman who um, was on our project and working on it from the beginning and then taking on a new role is that really for her, it was emancipatory for her to be able to, um, you know, take on that new role um, and, and sort of be free to um, kind of not leave our research pro project, but sort of change her, um, her interaction within it. And so I would just say to, again, be open um, um, to uh, the ways that anti-oppression um, is supposed to be, to me, to be felt um, in, in action um, throughout research. Thanks, Ruth. I see Brenda has her hand up. Maybe she wants a final. <laughs> Thanks, Polly. I don't want a final word by any means, but I, it just strikes me, Ruth, this was fantastic. And I'm aware um, that there are many students on the call. And I'm thinking about the fact that we have a fairly robust um, curriculum at CQ where we teach lots of students. And so much of your work could be both inspiring, but also instructive. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice um, or thoughts about what we should be teaching students uh, who want to do the kind of work you're doing or who may need to think about the kind of work they're doing differently. Um, and I know that you've taken courses in the C curriculum. So if you can sort of cast your mind back to some of that. Um, any thoughts on, on, on training? Um, hmm. well, I, you know what, what I would say is that for me, um, I am very much grounded in community. 
Um, for me, there is no, and I think we learn this as critical qualitative researchers that there, there is really no end point um, to the research field um, that because it is grounded in, um, you know, those experiences, the everyday experiences, you really cannot um, almost come up with research questions that are going to be transformative unless you are embedded within the community. And so, you know, your interactions with community does not necessarily just start at the point that you would like to complete your research. Um, really, to me, transformative and emancipatory research is ones that comes from the questions that are arising within the community. And the only way that you're going to know that is if you are there. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, I think the academy gives me the freedom to be able to, as Brenda kind of saw the, the office that I'm in before we started, but I'm right now in a, in a community space where um, we support a lot of different people, also encampment workers. And so I'm in this space and the academy gives me the freedom to be here, to be able to be with community because had I been a nurse working in a hospital, it would have been a, uh, a different situation. I would not have um, the ability to move um, but I, I think that would be where it is that, you know, theory and, and being theoretical is also about being within community and, and starting from a place of um, knowing and experience. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I want to just thank everybody for coming. What an engaging and lively question and answer period. And as I mentioned, lots going on in the chat. Um, thanks, uh, of course, to you, Ruth, and also to Martha and Janice and um, Annika for your contributions. That was really special to have you involved. And I think was a was a good way of modeling, perhaps, how future talks uh, we might include more voices. Um, so I really appreciate that. Thanks to Naomi for the beautiful introduction and always thanks to Tenzin for working out the technical piece for us so that it all worked out. And um, just a reminder that the next uh, CQ seminar is scheduled for Friday, January 21st. This is with Dr. Josephine Wong, whose presentation um, was postponed due to the U of T censure and uh, which has now been lifted. And so we hope that to see you all there. Thank you again and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Marsha. Thanks, Anika. Thanks, Janice. <laughs>